Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Friday, June 25th. I'm Ash Bennington, joined by our CEO and co-founder, Rao Pal. Rao, always a pleasure to have you back. Always good to be here. I'm back in Little Cayman this weekend. It's Global Macro Investor Writing Weekend. So I come here for a bit of peace and quiet, try and concentrate and figure out what the hell's going on. This is when you go into the bunker. It's exactly right. <laughs> so, Rao, here we are. It's Festival of Learning Week at Real Vision. Yeah, it's been amazing, right? Ridiculous. I mean, that that kind of festival headlining triple act last night was crazy with Neil Ferguson, Josh Wolf, Josh Wolf and Daniel Kahneman, and then all three of them together in a round table. I mean, that was a special piece of Real Vision magic. But the whole thing has been incredible. I mean, all the Real Vision rock stars are here um, teaching people as much as they can to help people navigate their own financial journeys. It's amazing. Yeah. Tell us, Ross, some of the conversations that you've participated in uh, that you found particularly interesting and what you learned from them. Um, well, I've been in and out because I've been so busy doing other stuff as well. So I've been in and out of as many things as I can. Um, it's generally the humility that people in financial markets have once they've been around a while. I think that's always a key factor is not, and I always say this, is the moment you think your shit smells of roses, you're gonna get your face rubbed in it. Um, and that's the whole point is you need to be humble. You need to self-analyze. You need to understand what your biases are and whether they're hindering you or helping you. Um, and I think that was you know, one of the big functions of the entire thing is that, is that psychology around all of that. Yeah. I'm also curious, as this is the Enter the Bunker weekend, tell us what you're thinking about right now. Yeah, so I'm kind of, I think the markets are in a transition phase. Um, and I think we're transitioning from the inflation narrative to a lower growth narrative. And Lakshman um, from ECRI and myself talked about this on the Festival of Learning. It feels that the market is going to be overestimating growth and inflation for the next six months, potentially. And that's pretty common after a recession, you get this growth spurt as everything comes back online, and then it tends to weaken off. So I see a reasonable amount of economic evidence for that, and I'm gonna be digging into that over the weekend to look at that. But I think that over the next six months, economic growth is weaker, inflation is weaker. Inflation is the hot narrative in markets right now. We had the inflation data today. People are, oh my God, bond yields went up again. But bond yields have actually been falling for a few months now. And that I've always said, bonds generally speak the truth. Now, yeah. question is, is how far bond yields can fall. And that's what I'm focused on, because this transition is important. If bond yields break, 10-year bonds break 140, which is the uptrend, then they could go significantly lower. That's, again, almost always happens after a recession. Bond yields actually go lower again. So I'm looking for that. I'm under looking at the fiscal cliff that's coming. Uh, many of the fiscal policies start rolling off. Um, I'm looking at the effects of the post reopening. So there's pent up demand and that slows down how much has been brought forward. And I know that uh, David Rosenberg spoke about that with Ed uh, this week as well on Real Vision. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking at all of those things. Um, and I just get the feeling that this transition will see bond yields fall. That probably would coincide with the dollar. The dollar looks like it wants to break upwards from an inverse head and shoulders. I talked about this last week on the daily briefing. Um, or you can use the euro chart, which is a fantastic chart, which is a huge head and shoulders top. Um, and if that breaks kind of the 118 level, OK, we could see a significant move from here. That would be the dollar going up. And I've explained to people the dollar going up tends to slow growth, tends to lower the inflation narrative, tends to bring down commodity prices. Uh, that would coincide with the falling of bond yields. So there is a potential setup there. I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but that shift would create a shift for markets as well because value outperforms growth in these more inflationary times because yeah. of the discounted future cash flows of these growth businesses. And if that transitions, then we'll see the exponential age stocks start to perform. And we've seen, we've had a good week for stocks like Apple, Arc the semiconductor index, and um, let's say stuff like Twitter. So a lot of these kind of new economy network effect stocks were doing well as bond yields came off, but we haven't got a full signal yet. The other thing about transitions is 
it can upset markets. It tends to coalesce risk. So if you get a transition in narrative, you can often see a sell-off around that period as well. So I'm, I've kind of got my eyes open on all of this stuff right now. Nothing has immensely changed yet. The only thing for me is I see some of the growth indicators coming off. I see the Chinese growth coming off, and I see bond yields overall edging lower. Yeah. Well, as you work out over this weekend, your position on this, you're thinking on where we are right now. Can you give us the broader framework for what you see and how you think about uh, the transitions out of recession? For example, you mentioned that bond yields typically fall during that period. I think it's so important for people to understand the bigger framework that you're working in. Talk about what the traditional structure is, because I know in some ways you have a, a view uh, that sort of builds on the consensus narrative in a slightly different way. Yes, I mean, generally speaking, well, in fact, always, bond yields fall coming out of a recession. They rise at the end of the recession. The growth narrative becomes too excessive because really economies coming out of a recession take time before they get traction. And it usually requires two more rate cuts or, in the case of the last recession, five years of QE before you can let the stabilizers off. So I know everyone's like, oh, the Fed inflation, but we don't know we can take the stabilizers off. I don't think we can. So normally you get a growth slowdown pretty quickly afterwards. Often equity markets will have some sort of retest, some correction as they're like, oh, what's going on here? We're going to a double dip recession. What's going on? Bond deals tend to fall. That's usually the process. Then we usually get more stimulus and the markets go again, go up again. Everything recovers, bond yields either continue to fall or start to their, their rise that happens over the business cycle. So right. the business cycle is now the predominant driver of what's going on, and that should eventually transition to further growth. And if that happens and the dollar stabilizes, I think it goes up for a bit in this weak growth period. If the dollar then stabilizes, then people start moving out the risk curve. So that's growth stocks will do well, and then out to emerging markets. And that's generally how things play out coming out of recessions. Yeah, such an interesting point and a key framework, I think, for understanding uh, the past and also framing the future. Yes, and people over-extrapolate commodities. Yes, some commodities are going to do really well over this full cycle, but not all, I don't think. Um, things like copper I've talked about before because that's related to the ESG trade because electricity you know, needs to be conducted somehow and copper is the best thing in the world to do it. So you need tons of it, um, so or millions of tons of it to be exact. So the sum of these commodities is going to do really well. If the dollar is not falling, then things like agricultural commodities will get over the supply and demand issues and that will die off. So I don't think we're going to see massive demands for steel and cement and you know, other big kind of industrial stuff. I think we're going to see a bifurcation, which is a word you and I haven't used in a while, but a bifurcation in commodities. And I don't think the commodity trade is a one single trade. And we'll have rolling issues with commodities until the global economy is fully opened and the supply chain backlog has sorted itself out. So, you know, oil could drive higher for the time being. That gas is now you know, um, is appreciating on the back of the hot summer in the US that looks like it's going to be a record summer. You know, there's a lot of different stories going on, but I think that eases over time and the inflation narrative will ease and people are going to be focused on, okay, where can I get growth on my capital from? And I think it's going to come from the exponential age style investing. Um, and I think it's going to come from emerging markets. Yeah. Well, I should say the questions are already starting to flow in, uh, but a couple of things I wanted to touch on before we jumped into our viewer questions. I don't know if you've seen this piece yet, Rob, but there's a piece that's live today uh, on Real Vision Crypto. It's a conversation that I had with Hugh Hendry uh, and Kevin Chu of Rally, uh, and I think it's an absolutely just intriguing type of conversation. It's yeah. kind of being... And I sent Hugh down this rabbit hole, right? Because I, I got him on, we did that um, live event, and I yeah. talked to him about communities and tokens, and his head just exploded. And I found him on Twitter, then reaching out to people, saying, who do I need to speak to? I set him up with a few phone calls, and then you set him up with Kevin to yeah. say, right, let's get... Because I love this, because I'm actually doing this on the platform as well. If people follow some of the stuff I'm doing in crypto, I'm actually trying to learn about this community tokenization stuff, because I think it's the future of all business models, and right. it's going to apply to Real Vision as well. 
And I've sent Hugh on that path, so he's like acting as a, another agent in this in this learning journey for all of us to follow, because this is a great way to follow by pigging back on somebody else. A great way to learn is pig back on somebody else's learning. Totally. I, I was describing this uh, to some of our colleagues here at Real Vision by saying this is the kind of conversation that happens every day in Silicon Valley, on Sand Hill Road, uh, in New York, in the city of London, but you actually get to watch it, right? I mean, that's such an intriguing aspect of this. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the, well, I want to do more of this at Real Vision to send people on these journeys of understanding. So I'm trying to do that with this exponential age, and I'll be doing a lot of content on that, and Real Vision will do some too. We will do learning journeys on like this tokenization and the future of business models. That's another one of my personal favorites. You know, we'll take people down the emerging market journey and hopefully the commodity journey. And, you know, some of these other journeys, you know, gold and gold miners, that's another big journey for people to take. And, you know, coalescing around these big themes and letting people learn as we all learn yeah. is the right way of doing it. Yeah, that's, I think, perfectly said. Talking of journey, I know we have this clip queued up. Uh, Nick Correa, take it away. Hit the clip. Part of my initial draw was the notion that um, for people that aren't bestowed with, with a house or a share portfolio, et cetera, but just have latent talent and, and can come on, okay, that we can turn them into, into assets. And here I am, and I was the former asset manager, and I'm opinionated about asset valuations. Um, I still don't, so I, I'm, and again, I hope this dialogue can continue because I think in terms of trying to open it up to the real vision community and others, I'm willing, more than willing to offer myself up as, as a real life experiment. I don't know if I get past you my tequila, my same bars, but um, you know, so I, I, I really have envy to set up a hue coin. And there you have it, Ral, exactly what we were just talking about, the journey. You can actually see uh, Hugh journeying down this path uh, and talking with uh, Kevin Chu, who's truly one of the experts in this space. Yeah, I love Kevin. Really interested in what Rally are doing. Um, you know, it's a really ambitious. I don't think most people understand it yet, but um, I think it's going to play a big part of the future. What's so great about Hugh is he has an inquisitive mind. Yeah. So many people approach things with dogma. And what you need to approach it with is pragmatism and an open uh, openness to learn. And if we can follow somebody who uses that approach, we get to learn more. I, I mean, I, I love it. I mean, I don't, as people know, I don't like tribalism. I don't like dogmatic ideas. What I love is people who are open to absorb. You know, again, I'll refer to the interview with David Rosenberg and Peter Bookfart, which was fantastic that Ed conducted his last interview at Real Vision. Yeah. That was amazing because these two guys were open to a discussion where they had opposing views and we could really dig in and learn. And that, that stuff's magic. Yeah, and what a swan song for the great Ed Harrison here at Real Vision to do that incredible piece. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, really great piece. So the questions are rolling in, and I want to start uh, asking these, unless you have something else that you want to touch on, Rob, before we jump in. No. Uh so the first question uh, is one that I've been thinking about, I know you've been thinking about. Uh, it comes to us from Ryan, and the question is, consensus is that inflation has started, but Bitcoin is struggling. What are your thoughts? I think it's wrong to try and analyze Bitcoin with a macro perspective outside of the longer run. So the longer run is central bank balance sheets uh, are expanding, and that's an ongoing process that will, you know, over the next decade, we expect that to continue. There is very limited correlation between Bitcoin and any other macro thematic. There's very few factors that you can isolate. The factors in Bitcoin right now is this mining shutdown and restrictions right. in China, and that is causing selling. What's fascinating is crypto volumes have imploded. So that's telling you that the liquidations are over. I think we're in the final stages of, of this repositioning from China, and the markets will stabilize in due course. We're already seeing whales accumulating at a very rapid rate now, and it feels that the process of Chinese handover of crypto to the world is close to an end. It always happens on the bloody weekend. I don't know why. The Chinese are obviously too busy to do it on the, during the week, and it's only on the weekend they can hit the sell, sell, sell button. And then, you know, we have to deal with that. But, you know, it is what it is. And I've talked about this um, a lot. 
It's very similar to 2013 in, in Bitcoin. The peak to trough sell-off was about 65%. Um, it feels that this is going to be something very similar. And then before you know it, the narrative changes. I was um, swapping emails with Tom Demark, um, who very graciously sends me the odd email about stuff. And um, he was looking for the market to trade lower over this weekend. And he's been telling me this for a while now. And he was looking for a potential low of about 25,000 in Bitcoin. That would be the low. And I'm getting a number of different corroborating evidence that somewhere between here and there, and probably in the next week, maybe even less is the low. And that's, that's how I think about it, too. I think we're very, very close. Yeah, three things. You know, number one, I think that's uh, spot on about the uh, Chinese story is what's driving the short term uh, price fluctuations, not the broader macro story or even the broader use case uh, for Bitcoin or skepticism about it, I should say. Uh, number two, uh, really interesting to me uh, to, to just to just watch this and see that there seems to be a, a floor support at around the basically the 50 percent retracement from the 52 week high uh, around 32,000. I know it's dipped below briefly, uh, but it has bounced back relatively quickly within a period of like, I think, two or three hours when it dipped down to 29. There seems to be uh, some support at 32,000, 52 week yeah, high. Yeah. Also, what is interesting is there is this very obvious head and shoulders pattern, which everybody's freaking out about. But it broke it last week and then went straight back above it, which is interesting because normally a pattern like that breaks and it free falls. Let's see what happens over this weekend. But I think people should be on alert for a reversal soon in all of this. That's how I'm looking at it. I think we're done in time and price, pretty close. Mm. Number three, Ralph, why the hell do people liquidate their positions during the most illiquid periods of the market on the weekends? It's baffling to me. I, 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 don't, I just don't understand. Or has the market got itself in this psychological mess where they fear the weekend? What's China going to do to, you know, traders close out their positions? I have no idea. It's, you know, the madness of crowds. People yeah. always do the wrong thing at the wrong time. Yeah. Here's a great one uh, going back to some of the macro themes that we've been discussing. Uh, it's from N. Renovatio. And the question is, how to navigate risk of a potential transitory strong dollar while still playing the exponential age thesis? Rao, thoughts on the strengthening dollar uh, and the exponential age? I don't think the strengthening dollar is an issue because it lowers inflation and it means that U.S. assets are more attractive. So I don't think that's the issue you have to hedge um, for exponential age. Exponential age, you actually need to hedge with interest rates. So you might pair you know, some puts on the TLT against your long um, positions in these stocks. I haven't yet scaled into my exponential age bets. I'm thinking I might do something um, very soon, but I have not done it yet. So I'm still 100% crypto looking to allocate money into these themes, but I really need the inflation story to be clearer, i.e. bond yields telling me that it's safe to go ahead. I just don't have that yet. If you want to go early, and there's nothing wrong with that because it's a long-term theme, I'm just trying to finesse the entry point, then you can buy some puts on bonds, and maybe that's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. Once again, back to macro from Sir Pale Rider. Question for Ral, what are the macro factors that historically lead to stagflationary environments versus inflation or deflation? I, stagflation is something the market always shouts about, and I've never seen it. <laughs> so, so you know, it, it, not in my investing lifetime has stagflation been an issue. Um, right. It was probably an, an issue when I grew up in the UK at the end of the 70s. Um, but I, I don't see that. So that's like sticky inflation and lower growth. Um, I've just never seen that happening for extended periods of time. I think it's a temporary phenomenon driven by the business cycle and depending where you are in the business cycle. Now, could I be wrong? Of course I could be. Could we have structurally changed something that creates stagflation? Could it be the massive fiscal stimulus? It's possible, and many people are betting on that. My bet is not currently on that idea. Yeah, here's one that comes to us from George uh, Oskles, which is, will rising USD make euro seem to be in an inflationary phase, and will policymakers then want to tighten? Um, yes, there is a risk of that. If it fell, if the euro fell sharply, um, it would add inflationary pressure to Europe or perceived inflationary pressure. However, Europe is 
pretty much a not a closed economy, but most of the commerce from Europe comes within Europe. So it, it doesn't have as direct linkages as it would do elsewhere. The US, for example, being the world's largest importing nation, it becomes more of a problem. Uh, for Europe, less of a problem, but at the margin. And at the margin, that would then filter through, let's say, in six months' time or so. By that stage, we're probably ready for the next wave of um, economic growth and inflational bond yields rising. So kind of okay. it's OK for now, but we need to watch that. Yeah. I've got a very detailed question from Thomas uh, that I'm going to simplify a little bit, uh, which is, Raul, how are you thinking right now about COVID, uh, the spike in cases in some places in the world, uh, VAC statistics, and the economy more generally? I think COVID is going to be with us lot, much longer than most people expect, and it will continue to have rolling disruptions to supply chains and issues for global consumption. Over time, what markets care about is the rate of change, and the rate of change is improvement. So the markets will not worry. The, the, the human instinct is to worry about what happens if it comes back. The markets tend to look at the rate of change and say, even if it comes back, it'll be less than it was, and therefore it's OK. Barring anything that is major, and I think we will get a fear of major. I remember very much after 9-11, Everybody was looking for a problem somewhere. It, right. was the, it was fear, right? Fear. So we still have a lot of fear in markets. People fear a recession. People, uh, yeah, another recession. People fear a lot of things. They fear the virus coming back. They fear their, they fear their restrictions being, their, their freedoms being restricted again. I get it. But usually, usually it's misplaced. It's like after a hurricane. Um, it feels like a hurricane here. It's a big stormy day. But um, after a hurricane, everybody fears the next hurricane. Right. People always want to buy insurance after the house has been robbed. Yeah. Uh, Raul, here's one that comes to us from Jeff. I'm going to do a slight paraphrase here. Uh, Jeff uh, is asking this question, basically. Um, he, at one point, you had said that there was the potential, in your view, uh, for negative rates in the U.S. potentially going out as far as the 10-year uh, going negative. Uh, Jeff is wondering if that's something that you still think is a possibility in the longer term. Yes, absolutely. I think the chart of truth, the 30-year chart of bond yields, probably still holds and that we would have a new low. I don't know. Maybe, like Japan, eventually what you see is in the next kind of weaker growth period, weaker inflation period, the bond yields don't make a new low, and then it'll suggest things have stabilized. I still think it's a possibility. I think the market discounts it, and they don't, they, they don't want to believe it yet, because so many people are inflationists at core. Um, but this deflationary trend driven by debt de demographics, globalization, and technology are relentless. Yeah. Talking of which, I know we are trying to bring this train in on time and finish these shows in 30 minutes, uh, but this is a great question for Medjid that I wanted to uh, get to you. It's Medjid X, and the question is, well, it starts out, Raul is everywhere these days. He's at the Festival of Learning, the Daily Briefing Live, the hardest working man on the planet, and all from paradise. Bloody brilliant, mate. <laughs> and the question is, when are we getting a big move in precious metals? Medjid X says, I can't imagine a better scenario after the last Fed meeting. Precious metals move on three things. A weaker dollar. So they moved up when the dollar fell. If the dollar's going stronger, precious metals aren't going up yet. They also offset the balance sheet of the central banks over time. And the rate of change of the balance sheet expansion is slowing for now. I think it will pick up again later. So that's a bit of a headwind. Um, and they tend to follow bond yields, whether it's real yields or nominal yields. So they tend to, uh, precious metals tend to rally in deflation and not inflation right now. So those three things are not in place. Hmm. And you don't need all three but we don't have the strong catalyst for gold right now, which is why it's such a painful trade as we wait for one thing or the other. Raul, as we get ready to start our Friday nights, our weekends, any final thoughts? 
No, apart from, I say no, and then I start with something. Uh, yes, <laughs> just keep, keep your eye on the transition phase. It may not come off, but our macro job is to look at potential probabilities. And I see the probability of bond yields breaking that up channel at 140 in 10 years. And I see the euro could break down and that would be a broader signal for the dollar DXY to break up. Focus on that. It's gonna give us our signal for the exponential age or otherwise. These two macro variables are the most important in the world. They will stabilize at one point, they will become less important, but we're too early into a recovery to start nailing our colors to the mast and transitions can be painful. So, you know, I think the market has a lot of risk going on right now and this transition could cause a risk unwind. And again, I don't think that lasts long, but you know, these kind of setups can be quite sharp and nasty. So let's see. Yeah. Raoul, in all these many years I've known you, the answer to the question, any final thoughts, has never been no. <laughs> Are you saying I talk too much? <laughs> no, I'm saying you add exactly the right amount of value. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. <laughs> Raoul, as always, a pleasure to talk to you, especially on a Friday afternoon in summer. Always good. And uh, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Enjoy your weekend, everyone, and thank you for watching. Uh...